Hey everyone, uh, welcome in. My name is Glenda. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective and we're very excited to host tonight's event with some contributors to one of PM Press's latest releases, The George Floyd Uprising, a collection of writings from one of the biggest uprisings in half a century. Tonight's event is brought to you by Firestorm Books, a 14 year old worker owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called West Asheville, North Carolina. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this land, it is our collective responsibility to pay respect and recognize that West Asheville is on the traditional territory of the Eastern Band of the Cherokee tribe. And we are here because this land was occupied and because of histories of chattel enslavement of black people and genocide of indigenous peoples. Firestorm is a general interest bookstore, but we are known for our curated mix of titles related to anarchism, queerness, feminism, social movements, and other radical politics. We ship books all across the country, and if you haven't checked us out, our full catalog is available on our website, which I will drop links to in the chat. Firestorm is also historically a community event space. However, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've transitioned entirely to an online virtual event space and we'll continue hosting free virtual events like the one you're attending tonight until we feel ready for our hybrid virtual and in-person events, which will hopefully happen at our new space over at 1022 Haywood Road, just a mile down the block from our current location. Um, we host free reading groups with rad local organizers and cultural workers and virtual author events in collaboration with indie publishers. So I'll also drop a link to our community calendar in the chat. For those attending in a live audience, there will be time throughout the discussion at the end of, um, and at the end of tonight's conversation for Q&A. So if you're interested in asking a question at any point, I encourage you to submit them throughout the discussion by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screens if you're attending on Zoom or in the comments if you are following along on the Facebook live stream and our speakers will do their best to respond. And now I'll introduce our speakers. Um, Arturo Castillon is a writer and substitute teacher living in Philadelphia. With Shimon Salam, he is the co-author of The Revolutionary Meaning of the George Floyd Uprising, has published work in the George Floyd Uprising, as well as in Black Quantum Futurism, Space Time Collapse Two. Ryan is an artist, writer, and international woman of mystery. <laughs> The Vortex Group is an anonymous collective of writers who desire an end to this world and the beginning of a new one. And I will pass it on to Arturo. Thank you. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for being here. Uh, hopefully, there's a lot of questions and people have a lot of engagement with what we're about to say, because we're, we're hoping this is a discussion. So what I'm about to read is a uh, is a statement put together by a bunch of people, not just me, uh, but from the overall Vortex group. And it's called, The Future is Open. The George Floyd uprising is not a neutral history or a general perspective on the 2020 uprising. The authors and editors, many of whom prefer to write anonymously, all fought in the revolt. While they might disagree on many things, all agree that the George Floyd uprising continues to stand as the defining event of our lifetime. More than a collection of texts, this, is a, this book is a catalog of tactical, political, and strategic findings from within the heart of the uprising. The texts collected here express a shared desire to push the revolt to its limits, to expand and deepen the nature of the antagonism and to spread it into new areas of society. These are firsthand accounts written in the heat of the moment in various cities, as well as a broader synthetic analysis that seeks to identify debates, blockages, and controversies that characterize the movement as a whole. As a conversation between militants, this book is unique in that it speaks from within the plane of combat. By collecting these texts, our aim is not only to clarify what worked and what didn't, but to crystallize and transmit the experience of the uprising itself 
in the hopes that future revolts can learn from this event and go even further next time. No one knew before George Floyd's vicious murder on May 25th, 2020, that three days later, the third precinct would be engulfed in flames. But it happened, whether we prepared for it or not, and it will happen again. And the next time, there could very well be two, three, many burning precincts. The future is open. The goal between now and the next uprising is to build the party of insurrection. This means experimenting with new forms, developing practical skills, pushing the boundaries of the possible, analyzing the limits of the present, and organizing ourselves for the inevitable ruptures that are coming. Assuming we are for revolution, the 2020 uprising is our guide to the next steps we must take in this process. We can't fully understand the cowardly murder of Tortuguita in the Willani forest or the struggle against Cop City in general without centering the George Floyd uprising. The plan to build Cop City is a direct reaction to the revolt, which decimated and demoralized police departments across the country. The effort to build a state-of-the-art police training facility is nothing less than an attempt to prevent the revolts of the future. None of this is coincidental. Without foregrounding the uprising and the fear that the ruling classes have of its return, we can't make sense of the speed with which police charge their own for the brutal murder of Tyree Nichols in Memphis. The police are desperately trying to avert the possibility of another uprising. Much, lar much larger battles are coming, which will culminate in either revolution or counter-revolution. What we do now shapes what we will do when the crisis again reaches a boiling point. So we stand here today not to sell you a book, but to begin a conversation on what must be done to defeat the most powerful ruling class on the planet. This is what needs to happen if there's ever going to be a worldwide revolution. What other choice do we have? If we aren't organizing ourselves for insurrection and civil war in the heart of the empire, then we might as well start canvassing for Joe Biden and the other progressive counterinsurgents. We speak in such stark terms because for every Natalie White, Aruj Rahman, Michael Reinhold, and Winston, Winston Smith, there are thousands of Bernies, Ilhan Omars, and AOCs. For many decades, we have seen the American left lie to itself and the world. Visions of revolution turn into betrayals. Vote for Obama to fight racism. Vote for Bernie to stop fascism. Vote for Biden to protect undocumented immigrants, to reform the police, to protect Roe v. Wade. Every compromise that sees itself as an advance is two steps back from where we need to be. We do not know when this pattern will change. It remains to be broken. The grim reaper of American reformism threatens to consume us all. All we can do now is make the best use of our bodies and minds while the uprising is still fresh and we are still honest. We didn't write this book to make money or to be popular. We wrote this book to begin the next stage of the conversation, to meet revolutionaries and to continue the fight. Okay, thank you. That is it for me. You wanna take it away, Ryan? Yeah, thanks. So I'm Ryan, I'm coming from Gadigal country and it's also known as Sydney, Australia. What I'm gonna do is read through an attempted summary of the book, which I've created by categorizing themes or through lines, which I hope we can discuss together. The introduction to this book is titled Welcome Back to the World. The title comes from a one-liner spray painted near the still burning third precinct. Encountered in those conditions, the phrase invites a number of interpretations. The most obvious applies to the massive crowds which had risked COVID-19 and taken to the streets, leaving the solitary conditions of their homes and returning to the world. In another interpretation, we might take welcome back to the world as affirming the arrival or resurgence of the proverbial old mole 
of the revolutionary spirit, which had not surfaced in the US to the extent seen over the course of that summer since the 1960s. Or if we wish to think in more recent terms, we might apply welcoming to the world to the next iteration of the cycle of struggle begun in Ferguson, Missouri and the origins of BLM. My favorite interpretation comes from the last essay in the book, Memes Without End, which reads the slogan as welcoming the confidence displayed by the rebels who acted in line with their ethics. Welcoming back, in other words, a sensibility where judgments are not made in a vacuum, not made in the form of an appeal for someone else to do something, but with all the concomitant actions that they entail. The anthology welcomes readers back to the world of George Floyd uprising and offers interpretations of those events as varied as those above. The variety of the collection is to be expected as events played out in different ways across the country. The pieces gathered in this collection take us back to that summer and early autumn through the eyes of those who saw new horizons of revolutionary potential spread across the heart of empire and sought to hold on to the lessons of their experiences. This is a book for those who take riots, looting, and revolution seriously. It is for those who ask themselves questions about the methods, tactics, and insights of how the rebellion spread and how those energies were rerouted, curtailed, or brought to an end. It is for those for whom the meaning of the, rebe of the rebellion has not yet been answered. With that in mind, I want to highlight a few different through lines that struck me. These are composition, rumors, tactics and weapons, and a revolutionary line and abolition. So first, composition. Composition does not just refer to a question of demographics or statistical analysis of what kind of person was there or why. The uprising began as a Black-led multiracial crowd or as Idris Robinson puts it in How It Might Should Be Done, the uprising was spearheaded by a black avant-garde, a phrase he uses to distinguish initiative from leading or leaders. But he also notes every conceivable kind of person participated in the revolt. Yet questions about composition remain salient for those who are interested in seeing rebellious action spread to wider sections of society including workplaces and sectors of capital flow. There are three main ways composition is approached in the book. The first approach is about the presence of white people in and with the struggle. And we'll return to the presence of white people on the far right and or against the struggle in a minute. In the return of John Brown, white race traders in the 2020 uprising, Shimon and Arturo see the development of white people willing to riot and fight as an opportunity to destroy the white cross-class alliances they identify as the glue holding U.S. society together, and thus the fragmentation of this alliance as necessary for all U.S. struggles. In an in-depth history of the political economy of the U.S., where spending cuts are accompanied by increased police budgets and how conditions were especially strained during COVID, can be found in Prelude to a Hot American Summer. The analysis that Jared and Jana advance here, in which a series of economic, political, and social conditions led to crisis, leads credence to the idea that Arturo and Shaman advance when they say crisis educates the white proletariat. However, most of what the essays report is that racial divisions which constitute American life were at least temporarily diminished at the height of the rebellion, showing how different ideas of racial and strategic composition played out and rapidly changed on the ground. For example, the essays Frontliners to the Front, parts one and two, describes the transition from the identity politics line of white people to the front to the rebellious logic of frontliners to the front. The second approach to composition is as a kind of strategy, or if not a strategy that we can put forward, then at least something that we have to embrace as a part of our conditions and that we can understand as a necessary and positive function of decentralized and autonomous movements or what some call leaderless swarms. 
This approach to composition helps us think about how both spontaneous and sustained actions happen, whether it's through the courageous and ungovernable crowd formation, which drew people out into this crowd formation um, from the, the siege piece, or it's the crowds that drew people out into the streets for over 100 nights in Portland. What these two articles emphasize is that the various compositions in the crowds in Minneapolis and Portland allowed for a flourishing of simultaneous actions, perhaps understood in different ways, yet nonetheless directed at a common goal. In this way, we can see composition as primarily differentiating from a diversity of tactics approach, especially as people are invited to play different roles, such as those outlined in the Siege of the Third Precinct. To illuminate my point about composition as allowing for participants to conceive of their activities in different ways, I'll give two quick examples. In Rhythm and Ritual, Composing Movements in Portland's 2020, the authors talk about chance as having different reference or senses for people. While the CH piece discusses people in the front chanting, hands up, don't shoot, as getting to do something which they saw as a moral or nonviolent way of participating, while the ballistics people in the back were able to use them as shields. Interestingly, we might also add the essay without means without end to this subsection of composition as strategy, even though it offers another idea of composition altogether. Here, Adrian suggests that it's not leading actors but leading gestures which allow the rebels to take up the cause for their own reasons by repeating acts or gestures propagated by the movement. This form of composition is not determined by identity, shared grievance, institutional relation, but by these leading gestures, that is repeatable acts, that is memes. The yellow vest being one meme and the burning of um, the yellow vest in, the, in, in France and the burning of the precinct being attempt at the creation of one. The third way that composition appears in the book is in order to discuss decomposition and its reasons. What the framework of decomposition offers us is a window into how quickly composition can change into a minefield of potential enemies where co-option, co-op, yeah, and counterinsurgents threaten to kill the party with their reforms, their NGO aspirations, and their willingness to accept concessions. It is the here that is that we see the resurgence of divisions as black and white people or as good and bad protesters. And this is also the world of betrayal, where those who maybe should have been with the revolt are seen as partially responsible for its demise. Thus, Shaman's pieces and ideas about the rise of Black counterinsurgency, which places blame on the Black faces in high places for turning revolutionary abolition into reformist abolition. In other words, it's not just the police and politicians who crush the rebellion, but the internal limitations of the movement. Returning again to the memes without end piece, we might also say that is the inability for the movement to repeat the leading gesture of burning a precinct, or for it to exhaust the capacities of the productive differences between political riots and storefront riots. Similarly, yet with a different th thematic urgency, we can talk about the ways that the rebellion was crushed or altered by my second topic, rumors. And here I also wanna include counter narratives and opportunistic reframing. So obviously this topic dovetails with the idea that there were divisions among the participants and contradictory ways of conceiving of events. But here we're not just talking about internal dynamics, we're also talking about outright denials and fabrications. I remember the red pay panel when I first heard how it might should be done. And Idris comes on and he says, a militant nationwide uprising did in fact occur. And I just remember feeling that and being like, yes, someone's saying it. 
good. It's weird that we have to say this. Obviously, we knew that it had, but the level of denial about this is insane. And I think it demonstrates the level of psychological warfare any movement has to contend with. I'm also thinking here of Nevada's piece, Imaginary Enemies, Myth and Abolition in the Minneapolis Rebellion, which tells another insane story of the ways the police narratives of white supremacists and outside agitators were used to divide the rebels and basically deny black agency when they claim that the destructive elements of the riot were all white supremacist outside agitators. Thus, many acts of these people. Thus, Minneapolis ends up seeing people who thought that they were with the movement going out and protecting businesses and properties and basically just doing the, the job of the cops through, through community policing. Yeah. Um, and I'm also thinking of the movement in Portland and the Portland Press Corps which were essentially movement journalists and became really important. And they were journalists that were on the ground participating and seeing everything through their own eyes and thus had the motives to tell the truth um, as one would if you're also getting shot with rubber bullets. Um, as well as the other essays which call for fact checking and watching out for rumors and lies which can also be detrimental to the morale and add to confusion. The idea of counter narratives and reframing as a mode of repression is also brought up in Memes Without End, where it's discussed as the war over the meaning of the war itself, or as the conflict over conflict, which can happen when what Adrian calls the social movement apparatus tries to assert, define, or delineate the meaning of the rebellion and directs all the attention and energy to a limited demand like defund. Third um, bullet point theme that I want us to think about, tactics and guns. As the report back section makes clear, the summer saw the import of strategies, tactics, and tools from Santiago, Hong Kong, and elsewhere. But the, by the end of the summer, people were geared up, but we came with our own uniquely American flavors too. And the tactics of car caravans spread around the country um, and of course guns. In the US, we have to deal with guns. While weapons and ethics, the piece weapons and ethics and the piece at the Windies and the mere notion of Kenosha brought up throughout sees guns as creating specialized militants and foreclosing the spaces and abilities of others seeking to join without that level of participation. The essay letter to Michael Reinhold sees the use of guns as a way of asking us if we are ready to draw blood and if we are ready to accept a civil war or the civil war a revolution might entail. I wrote would, but then I changed it to might. Interesting. Um, fourth line, a revolutionary line and abolition. I put these together. The last theme I wanna to touch on is the significance of a revolutionary line or horizon. And categorically, this is also where we place abolition. These are questions that sound like, what does victory look like to us? How can pro-revolutionaries articulate and share revolutionary ideas? What's at stake is not only the ways that the movement keeps the doors of potential open, but the ways that a shared sensibility around revolutionary objectives works to keep the militancy, which all of us are capable of, at bay, if only because we know there will be other fights and struggles. I found this need for a revolutionary line best articulated by the authors of At the Windies when they wrote about seeing people willing to die to defend a small parking lot containing the remnants of a burnt out fast food chain, a disposition they term fatalism. Likewise, when Inhabit says we must re-envision duty as our duty to repair the world, they offer a way out of the militant form of hero worship set against judgment. They write, heroism should be honored, but heroes cannot be the source of judgment. 
This is how every revolution has created a new police force and popular heroes have become the new tyrants. For them, what is demanded of all of us is that we accept a deeper sense of our responsibility to nurture our relationships with vulnerability and care. On the question of abolition and abolitionism, I think the intro puts it nicely when they write about diverging interpretations of the demand to defund the police and the ways that the prelude essay wants to see defund as having more potential than most of the other authors do. Perhaps New York Post Left puts it most generously um, when they write in Welcome to the Party, the abolition of the bourgeois institutions of police and prisons and borders is certainly a revolutionary goal, but it can only be achieved by a social revolution that abolishes class society and economy and the bourgeois state. For myself, I prefer to focus on a form of abolition which Arturo and Shaman advance when they define revolu revolutionary abolitionism as the material destruction of the range of police infrastructures, a definition we hear echoed in Adrian's call for demolitionism. On this note, one of my favorite antidotes in the book comes from the piece on Kenosha in the eye of the storm, where they write about how the Department of Corrections probation office had abolition graffitied on the side of it, but then was just burnt to the ground by the courageous rebels. Um, I hope people will share their own thoughts and experiences on composition, rumors, tactics and weapons, and a revolutionary line in abolition or whatever else. Um, and I'll leave us with the thought that perhaps what we are hoping to achieve is actually a world where our lives and politics extend to such a degree that they allow us to occupy the world we wanna see full time. And thus we will not need to be welcomed back to it at all because we'll live there. Yeah. Uh, cool. We have any questions in the chat? Doesn't seem like. Am no. I missing something? No audience questions. We're audience. very clear. No one has questions. Hmm. Um. I mean, I would say more, but I feel like you, you're was pretty rigorous everything that you said thank you um oh here's a question from shaman one current explains the defeat of the uprising on white proletarians the settler nature could you expand? Um, so I guess, there, I mean, I guess I've heard this before, um, but there's one explanation for why the uprising ended is basically that too many white people got involved. Have you heard that before? Okay. Like, like so many white people got involved that it co-opted the uprising because of uh, you know, white conceptions of like struggle that are basically trapped within whiteness and legality. And uh, I guess you could say settler colonialism is what Shaman is pointing to. So the kind of argument that uh, Jay Sakai would make mm -hmm. that, you know, there is no white proletariat and that white people, um, have this kind of like inherently reactionary role. But I don't know, I mean, it's kind of blasphemous, I guess, for some people, but my thing is like, I don't think there was enough white people involved in the riots. At least if we're talking about the uprising. 
and not be like, you know, activist protests. For me, a, yeah. a major lesson was that like, you know, for the most part, the white people were doing the activist protest and not enough white people were taking part in the uprising, like the actual like street riots. I think for myself, and I think what a lot of the essays make clear is that in the early days of the uprising, those first couple weeks or before early June and the, um, the, the National Guard and, and the police like really crushing a lot of it, it was very multiracial. And so I don't know that it would be like more white people being less rebellious or calling for more like peace policing or like more, um, you know, marches that just like stay on the sidewalk and, and chant about um, whose streets are streets from the sidewalk and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it was like the insertion of, of white people as a, as a question of composition that killed the, the early movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and for me, it was pretty noticeable in a place like Philadelphia, when the uprising first popped off in late May, it was extremely multiracial. And then when the Walter Wallace rebellion happened in late October, which is the piece that um, End of the Summer deals with. Mm. Um, so when the Walter Wallace uh, rebellion happened, that was October, and it was very noticeable that uh, I was pretty much the only white person on the street, uh, and that there was just a lot less white people involved. So, and for me, what that meant was that the, you know, the Black proletariat was basically fighting alone, and had kind of been abandoned by this larger opposition because the state was, you know, uh, more on it, more repressive, more ready for uprisings. Uh, in a lot of ways, it was more violent by that point. So for me, the, the issue of white people not being involved is like precisely the problem. I think um, the piece that's about Louisville and um, when the Breonna Taylor uh, when they decided not to indict the cops on that, um, also talks about there not being very many white people there and the black proletariat and people that were on the streets after that being kind of like left alone or abandoned. Right. Um, yeah. Should we read this next question? Yeah. Uh, from Benjamin Cates. Thank you for writing this. I'm only part way through, but it strikes me that in addition to excellent grounded analysis, the book is in a good way characterized by a profound sense of radical inspiration coming out of the uprising. I'm curious if any part of your thinking has changed at all in the time since you first, since you finished writing the manuscript. Do you have any immediate thoughts on that? I kind of do, yeah. One of the things that's been on my mind is, and I found this phrase in the book a lot that was like creative destruction. And it was like, we're destroying things at the same time. And, and or like the destruction itself is supposed to be a kind of like positivity. And I think people think in these terms a lot, like destroy negativity, what we don't want. This is an anti-police riot. This is like um, in against racism, right? Um, it's against all these things. Even looting can sometimes be seen as like against the commodity form. But I think there was like this idea that you could you could be positive in that. 
And I share that to some extent, but since this book or since writing for this and since thinking about these things in, in that context, um, I do kind of find myself wanting more positivity. And I don't know exactly what that means always. I, when I look at the, um, the Defend the Forest Movement in Atlanta, and I think about like the parties that they're throwing and like the way that all these different people are getting involved. It, it's very, um, it just seems like it's like an easy way of pointing to positivity rather than having to do a kind of like gymnastics of, of negative is positive. Though I do understand that. I'm not trying to say that's like not right. I just think also like a simple positivity is is something that I'm thinking more about. What about you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely related to that is just the it became it's become increasingly clear that rioting against the police and the anti-police horizon in general of of abolitionism is not enough. And mm -hmm. it's not enough to simply try to expand and sustain the riot because it has these kind of like inherent limitations that you're pointing towards. And, you know, things like, obviously, I think rebellions and street riots are extremely important to be oriented towards. But then, you know, the strength of the movement in Atlanta is that it has this composition that entails other forms of struggle that go beyond that. And, you know, like you're saying, you know, the, uh, the music festivals that happen in the forests, you know, uh, children, students, you know, uh, middle schoolers doing marches, all of, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, just daily kind of like mutual aid uh, for, you know, just like food and free clothing mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And, and also just having kind of like a, a certain territory that is kind of like a home base uh, in the forest. All of that, you know, is, is beyond just the right, right? And, and I think something that I really got caught up in in 2020 was just kind of like, you know, the street riots. And, it, you know, and to me, that was kind of like the ultimate uh, horizon for me. And then after 2020, it somehow became actually you know, pretty limited, uh, more so. And real quick, I just want to like plug the, uh, the Walani Forest, Atlanta Forest struggle and just mention real quick, there's a week of action coming up, uh, March 4th to 11th. There's going to be a week of action and it kicks off on Saturday the 4th at 11 a.m. And if you want more information about that, check out Defend the Atlanta Forest on Instagram or Stop Cop City on Instagram. Nice, good job. Um, I, I do think that there were some attempts to create places within the 2020 uprising, like obviously Seattle to some extent, um, and, and New York and these autonomous zones or chop chaz or whatever they ended up being called. Um, maybe Portland too, just because, you know, coming out to the same place consistently does kind of like make that a place. Um, but I, I don't know if that kind of like occupation is, is the sort of positivity that the next iteration of struggles is gonna take on. I think this forest one, because it um, encompasses so many things in this place and is a place that's like worth defending. There's something a little bit different there than like trying to defend I didn't, uh, this, this parking lot where this Wendy's was burnt down or trying to defend like um, uh, the, the precinct in, in Seattle. Um, so yeah, that was, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Shaman asked, Ryan, could you explain in more detail what the social movement apparatus is in contrast to the riot? 
wasn't the riot started by the left supported by the left? Um, so the social movement apparatus, just to be clear, is like not my phrase. It's It comes from the book and it's um, in Memes Without End, so I don't know that I can do it full justice. But I think that the idea is that all of the things that capture um, rebellious energies and try to um, delineate exactly what they're about or create like a meaning that can be translated to someone else, maybe in like the form of a demand or like, we want this. And like, I guess it would be like anything that, that kind of constitutes a group of people demanding something from power or that at, that wants to say, this thing is only about this would be my understanding of the social movement apparatus. And I think in the book, there are different ways of, of seeing like what, what popped off or like what made it pop off. Um, certainly in the prelude to a hot American summer piece, there's a lot of like, there's a background to this and um, the work of activists of, of, that have been doing BLM stuff and black, black liberation for years are, are part of the change in, I, I mean, I guess I would say change in consciousness that people needed to, to sort of like have the courage to say, okay, this is en enough is enough. We're going to like not let this happen anymore. We're going to respond somehow to the death of George Floyd. Um, other people in the book and that I, I talk to regularly see it as like, you know, there's there's just, it's, we live in a crumbling society and um, a crumbling country and, well, I'm not there anymore, but, you know, America or, and, and the world. Um, and so riots are going to happen. And it's um, the left and these like social apparatuses that are going to like, um, actually, there is this term swooping, which we haven't talked about yet, which I think was very popular in Portland and it just means to like come in and like take a, a crowd that could go anywhere and sort of like direct it with your megaphone and or you know their megaphone I don't want to identify with the megaphone but you use a megaphone I guess <laughs> and uh sort of tamp it down and maybe make them listen to speeches or I don't know, I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about, that kind of like settling down, using the creative energies in a very specific way and then telling everyone basically like, okay, get home safe, do you have a buddy, where's your car? Everyone be safe, 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 safe. And um, that's another way of thinking about, uh, you know, which came first, the, the, the rebellious parts of the riot and then the left or the left and then, the rebellion kind of like took it further maybe these are just different things and i yeah i think the book provides a lot of different angles on that too so i don't know i think i think that another like little element in this question maybe is um this tension between did rebels and um leftist marches or did 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 these things work together and in some ways i think yeah and and when i read over the siege of the third precinct piece again i think that it's really funny that you know people can be there hands up don't shoot and they think that they're doing the right thing and and that's great for them they're able to participate in a way that they think is meaningful and and helps them and like they're out there and then they're also able to be used as um, as shields and blockers for people that maybe want to be doing something else at the same time. And that's important. And so for me, I have trouble saying, OK, these are the people that are going to quash the rebellion with their leftist politics. Let's just put it that way. Um, and I, I, I want to want to see these things as working more together. Do you have anything to add to that, Arturo? Uh, no, 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 I laid it out well. Uh, like another, yeah, I mean, I think you already mentioned this, but maybe another way to think about the distinction between the social movement and the, uh, how did you put it, the riot? Uh, you can think about it as like the, uh, 
what Shaman does with the distinction between reformist abolitionism and revolutionary abolitionism, you know, or like the difference, you know, that Nevada points to in his piece between like the line is like one thing is to like hold a sign saying everything in the store should be free. Another thing is to go in the store and take it and to give it to everybody for free. Yeah. Um, so I think there are like real distinctions there, but yeah, I think sometimes they're not as separate from each other as we make them out to be. And oftentimes the the line between the two can be quite fluid. And people that are throwing down in the uprising can quickly become counterinsurgents. And sometimes people who are counterinsurgents can become even revolutionaries in a circle, you know, or, or insurrectionary or something. You know, so the I, yeah, the, I agree with you that the schema is not as clear cut sometimes as it's presented. Yeah. Should we read the next question? Absolutely. These, these questions are pretty hard. These these next questions uh, from anonymous. Antonio Gramsci talks about cultural hegemony and how many people hold the values of the ruling class as so they don't rebel. What about this uprising really broke through cultural hegemony in order to make a nationwide uprising and how can we make that happen again? Uh, I mean, I don't think there's any one thing that caused that situation. And, you know, we know we've seen people murdered brutally on video by the police before. I mean, I think there is something about the video of George Floyd's murder and how visceral it is um, and how fast it was shared and how widely it was shared. It is a factor, but I think, you know, like a bigger factor is the pandemic, which really created this crisis in the, the fabric of everyday life and just the rhythm of everyday life. Um, and then, you know, there's the Trump presidency. I think Trump being president is a factor. Um, you know, obviously, because of the pandemic, all the unemployment that happened. And then, all you know, a lot of people were getting unemployment money. So that probably helped. Uh, having, you know, for me personally, it was the most money that I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it was probably like my first experience with some kind of semblance of like social democracy in the U.S. It was under Trump. It was kind of weird. Um, and I think that kind of like weird social democratic situation for some people, at least the people that were able to like get unemployment, I think that contributed to making a lot of people want to throw down. Um, so I guess, I don't, I mean, I guess I, what I'm pointing to is, is like crisis, basically, like all, all of these are kind of like forms of crisis. So I don't think there's necessarily anything I mean, I guess there are things that we can do, like on the subjective level and just like in terms, but at the same time, I think ultimately the situation is beyond our control and it's more a matter of adapting to crises and also like a series of crises that have been layered on top of each other in such a way that creates an extremely volatile situation and being able to recognize when that's happening. I don't know, I'm kind of rambling. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I also, I agree with the idea that it's crises that enable us to see things differently. Crises open up things for transformation um, or let a broader swath of society experience kind of immiseration. But I also do think like things can happen because of anything. I don't know. I think maybe in the US that was like a, a very special circumstance, but people riot in other countries for a number of reasons. And um, hmm. I think it's possible. It might be, I mean, you know, it might be the trees in a park that are getting cut down. It might be the trees in Atlanta, mm -hmm. you know? Right. But I guess the question is, like, why, you know, like, why was it that a massive nationwide uprising happened in 2020, you mm -hmm. know, but it hasn't happened for any of these other situations? 
and like what is it that made you know right like because like yeah. there hasn't yeah. like solidarity <laughs> action around the country right but like we haven't seen like a mass uprising because of the situation in, in Atlanta there's been like you know black blocks that you know set cars on fire and stuff uh, happened a few weeks ago I don't know, but this is like a really kind of like intangible question too. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just. I, I, huh. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we could make that happen. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I think there's an element of like luck too, or something like that. Beyond just being able to like read the situation the right way. Uh and push it a certain way but okay so the next question is what is it that motivated white folks to get involved early what led to there being fewer later what are the lessons from george floyd uprising for getting more white folks and committed long-term to revolutionary activity i mean i guess my answer would be kind of similar to the last question which it was like all these crises uh, that compelled people to throw down that otherwise wouldn't have. And I think there's like, as the summer went on and it shifted into the fall, I think it got more violent. I think the state was way more on guard and ready to squash revolt way faster. So I think that kind of scared white people away. I, I think it just, the stakes became a lot higher. Uh, there was more guns involved. Mm -hmm. um, also you know the whole election around biden i think is a factor you know and biden and people mobilizing as trump and a lot of the energy of the uprising being redirected into that uh, i don't know that's that's all i really have off the top of my head yeah what are the lessons from George Floyd's uprising for getting more white folks more committed long-term revolutionary activity? Hmm. Do you have any lessons? Like that last part of the question? Um, I don't know. Learn how to like talk to people and don't rely on having a bunch of gear or your like basis of participation and like make mm -hmm. it clear through your actions, what you're about and what you're doing, not just through like the clothing that you're wearing or the kind of like aesthetic that you have. Hmm. I don't know. Because yeah, I definitely saw a lot of situations, especially kind of shifted away from the initial week of rebellion where you kind of had like white insurrectos that didn't really know how to relate to the unfolding street riot situation. And I'm thinking like specifically situations that were like mostly black riots. And um, a lot of it, I think, really came down to a lack of communication and a lack of being able to communicate why you were there, what you were about. And over reliance on like technology and gadgets and like you know street gear and looking like a you know ninja or something like that. Yeah, a weird sight. You would just have all these like white people in black block with all these like gadgets and stuff, just kind of standing on the side, being spectators, because they can't actually like orient themselves to the actual moment and like the people in that moment. Yeah. So, uh, the proliferation of gear was so crazy like I remember seeing people like you're saying that were all geared up and it was almost like all dressed up with nowhere to go but they were like right there and it, it was just like okay you got the costume but like what are you going to do with it right maybe will be just be more prepared for the future yeah yeah 
Um, hmm. Okay. We've got a lot of questions here. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to keep going through them. Okay. Uh, was Blackout Tuesday manufactured by police or was that something that was organized by activists and agitators? I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what Blackout Tuesday is. Was that the social media thing where everyone put like just a black card on their profile pictures or something? I don't know what that is either. Oh yeah, that was dumb. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't have anything to say about that. I don't know if it was manufactured by police or not. But it seems pretty empty of a gesture, given what was happening on the ground in the moment. That's my take on that. So, if that's but, what that is, yeah, I don't know. My guess is that it was probably activists, like well-meaning activists. You know, that would be my guess. From a yeah, I, I guess. For people, I'm thinking about people that are like at home or disabled or sick or, you know, whatever, like just can't get out onto the streets and like gestures and things that they can do. And I don't want to like just say like, I mean, even though I, I, I don't really know yeah, about Blackout Tuesday, if that's it or the, the square of black on social media. But I do think there are a lot of ways that people can get involved. And I think that Telegram ended up being really important. Um, people that were like listening to police scanners and were kind of like conveying information was a really important thing that people were doing from home. Um, you know, all the fundraisers and that were like for people that ended up going to jail or prison and needed lawyers or whatever, like there's a lot that you can do from home and that it does allow you to participate in a way that's not just being like a on the ground militant. And I don't know that like a, a square is of black, I, I, I don't know if this is what Black Hat Tuesday is, but like, I don't, I don't know if that's the most relevant thing that you could be doing from home. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of other way more important roles uh, that is not being like a street insurgent, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's not just sharing like a meme on social media or something. Uh, yeah. Memes though, you know, some memes are good. Yeah. I think the but, Hong Kong memes were really cool yeah. and they have like a lot of information. Um, For sure. But yeah, also you have to be careful with social media. So that's why Telegram is, is a cool thing. Let's move on. Okay. Um, okay, next question, anonymous. Can there be utility in attempting to absorb those liberal defund abolitionist currents into the real movement? If so, how? Thinking logistically here about how to not cater to those people, but to raise the stakes so that they might understand militant struggle as necessary and their responsibility as well. This is coming from my understanding of Jared and Jana's text, as well as that abolition may have potential beyond liberalism. I think that's the, the goal, you know? I yeah. think absorbing or working with or having much broader segments of society in a movement is crucial. Mm -hmm. How? Absolutely. Uh, Do you have any ideas for how? <laughs> oh, how? how? Uh, well, I mean, I think the, the uh, like what you've been saying about composition and, you know, like the, at the siege on the third precinct text is a really, shows a lot of really good examples of how people who might have these kind of like 
liberal kind of like moralistic pretensions you know were actually like in terms of just what they were doing regardless of like their ideas were serving an important role you know in the mm -hmm. composition of the crowd mm -hmm. um, even if it's just yelling at the police you know and like holding your hands up and saying uh you know hands up don't shoot or whatever um, but also, like, you know, the daytime protests that were happening, like, there would be, you know, a march that was more, uh, you know, peaceful and nonviolent or whatever. And that was actually really useful, like, the more rowdy marches somewhere else, because that would actually distract the police. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways, like, we're in practice. But I guess my thing is that it's not really... It's, a, it's more a matter of taking advantage of situations and heightening tensions and contradictions than, than like trying to win people over, if that makes sense. Or like convince people, like we're gonna sit there and have a conversation with people and then they're gonna like, you know, wanna support the more rowdy stuff. I don't think it happens like that necessarily. I think it's more about like uh, understanding, you know, the composition of the crowd and operating in a way that takes that into consideration. I'm thinking of like two different um, phrases that kind of repeat for me. One is that uh, there was some, maybe you remember this, I hope you do. There was some paper that came out where the police were like, we can control um, a thousand people march or a hundred thousand people march when it's all together but we can't control um a hundred a thousand <laughs> a thousand hundred people marches like the idea is they can control it when it's one big thing together but they weren't able to control a kind of like gorilla popping up sort of thing and i think that in that way like you're saying if there is like a kind of social movement leftist type of march happening over here but maybe the police don't know how that's going to go they have to be there or they have to have a presence there that means that they can't be over here and maybe rowdy stuff is happening over here um and then i'm gonna i'm gonna try to formulate the, the other phrase because it's it's there but it's not we can't articulate it yet Should we wait a second? Or... Um, <laughs> I think just like people come to you when you're doing cool stuff and they want to be a part of it and they feel invited. And it's not just like ideas that are going to make people change their minds is basically what I'm getting at in my head. So that's my answer. Yeah, yeah. Definitely agree. Um... Okay. Spencer says, I'm curious about the connection between insurrection riots and mutual aid in the summer 2020, including at the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle, Seattle. So a spatial articulation of it, how they related to each other and to what degree that relationship provides the basis for an insurrectionary communism slash communization. Cool. I think, thank you for bringing that up. I think that a lot of the mutual aid that was happening around that time is actually part of like all of the unanswered to all of the questions that we've been discussing because there was so much of that going on and a lot of it was able to just like quickly reorient and um, provide aid and, and um, like supplies and snacks, which were actually totally clutch um to rioters and marchers and people that were out there doing a lot of of um being out there i guess and um i think what i heard from people that were were more were participating more in the seattle stuff is that 
a lot of the mutual aid stuff and groups allowed them to have existing relationships with people that they didn't necessarily agree with politically, but they had this like level of knowing each other and trust and being able to rely on each other from mutual aid stuff um, and participating in other things together that allowed them to like be able to to work together even when they still didn't agree. Um, so yeah, I do think that that's just a basis for for it just trusting each other and working on projects that are around you and exist. And I guess the line is find each other. You can do that through mutual aid projects, I think. Okay, cool. We've got like the Instagram and for Defend the Forest and Stop Crop City, thanks. From Luna. If you compare the January 6th insurrection at the US Capitol, it was white dominated and well coordinated with the state. Key point, re-Floyd uprising, it was not white dominated. The ethnic composition was represented by the global majority, hence the militarized reaction from the state and the neoliberal media dominated by the narrative to characterize rioters as patriots. Arthur, did you hear that one? Sorry, yeah, I, I heard that, yes. Sorry about that. I really need to use the bathroom. <laughs> oh, okay, it's okay. Um, can you rephrase it for me? I'm not sure what, what the question is. Is there a question there? Maybe it's just a, a point. Yeah, you can compare them. Let's keep going. We've got a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. OK. It seems that we rebels are running into a problem. Is that where we're at? Yeah in that we are using the language of the dominant terms of black and white amongst ourselves that divide us, creating language that unites the American proletariat around action seems important. Thank you for the info on continuing action. Okay, mm -hmm. I mean, that's also kind of just an observation, uh, not really a question, but. Uh, mm. I mean, Spooky. until we- I'm oh, sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna read the next question because I think that was an observation. Swooping as a phenomenon makes me think of another grimmer sense of welcome back to the world. A return to the everyday world in which revolutionary energy is constantly contained, deflated, etc. But I also really appreciate your reflections on the movement to defend the Atlanta forest as a reminder of how many incipient worlds are out there. Thanks. Yeah. I'm just gonna keep going rather quickly here because we okay. are, okay. Do you need to um, leave us for a second? You good? Me, no, I, I, I took care of that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Um, similar to Brush's question above, but I'm thinking about the folks of all races slash identities who see themselves as supporting the rebellion and goals like abolition and an equitable world, but who are afraid of the riots and in many cases end up becoming counter-revolutionary reformists, as I think you put it. I feel like a lot of people who participated in or even organized the day 10 protests fall into this category. How might we encourage them to participate in the insurrection next time? Wish I had that phrase on top of my fingers. Um, Build trust, build relations with each other. Uh, I think maybe some people need to learn about, um, you know, basic anarchist tactics again. 
like building affinity groups with people that you really trust. Um, maybe one of the people that does a daytime riot can can be somebody that you um, do a banner drop with in the future. I don't know. That's what I'm willing to say on a Facebook Live event. Mm -hmm. Or a period. <laughs> yeah. I would also say, like, be willing to be okay with people being mad at you and yelling at you that you're, you know, out of your lane or something. Be willing to not listen to people who are trying to guilt you into, you know, doing something or not doing something. Um, also, look at the people that are fighting and probably see that some of them are literally 12 years old. Uh, I met, you know, people that had asthma, that had inhalers that were out there fighting. I met people who were in wheelchairs, running around in a wheelchair, throwing rocks at cops, doing all kinds of things. You know, I knew somebody that was immunocompromised that was out there trying to support it in some way or another out in the streets. So I would also just, you know, encourage people to think about that in terms of motivating themselves uh, to go out there. Because there's this idea that it only kind of like big, muscly people, you know, who have privilege or something are the ones doing the most dangerous, risky stuff. And I would actually like really disagree with that. I don't know, that, that was not my experience at all. And so keeping that in mind, because I think something that really demobilized a lot of people is this idea that it's not your place to do this, especially like as a white person or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, you're the ones that are causing all the trouble. You're the ones that are making it bad. But like, if you look at, just look at what's actually happening um, for me, and kind of goes back to what I was saying before is like, you, they needed more people like that involved. Yeah, I agree. I think there were a lot of different people out there and it was really cool. And, um, you know, even when it was just the people that were like in their cars and stayed in their cars the whole time and they were like pumping loud music and like that was exciting, making it more into a party vibe was like definitely very cool and necessary and helpful, I think. And, um, you know, one time I did see, oh, no, no, it's described in, yeah, it's described in a piece, too, um, where a car was in front of a bear cat and was just, like, slowly, slowly going. And that was a very helpful um, thing that happened. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm going to go on to the next question. Was the writing of this book informed at all by people and comrades outside of the U.S.? How was the uprising viewed in the imperial periphery and perimeter? I think that this book was, I mean, even if it was comrades that are from outside of the U.S., it was people that were in the U.S. at the time. I have been talking to people in Australia about it, though, and there were marches and rallies and, you know, some um, heated events here that they've been telling me about where um, they came out, even though it was locked down and they were sort of, they got into like a little bit of a confrontation with the police here. Um, but that's a good question. That's what I've been hearing recently there were things that happened elsewhere too. Do you remember all of this? I know a bunch of stuff happened, like solidarity stuff happened in Europe too, mm -hmm. and also Canada, if we're just talking about outside the US. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's hard to say how the uprising was viewed in the imperial periphery and 
perimeter. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. But I, I know that like a lot of people that were involved in the book have been involved in struggles, you know, like in uh, Greece, you know, the stuff that was going on in Greece in the late 2000s was a big deal for people. Uh, you know, stuff going on in Hong Kong, uh, Chile, you know, um, and then also within the U.S., you know, there's a whole series of struggles that people were involved in informing their analysis. So in that sense, you know, there's this kind of like way that the book is informed by those struggles, you know, and then the, uh, you know, the, the Egyptian revolution was a big deal, or the Arab Spring. I think all of that shapes a lot of people's ways of thinking about 2020. And we have seen like the equivalent of police precincts burnt down in other places mm -hmm. after. Right, yeah, like in Egypt or in Greece or Chile, yeah. yeah. Oh my God. So maybe that's one. Mm -hmm. Okay. In what ways can we combat reformist ideology in ways that bring more people to our cause? I feel like it, it, that, that's kind of just what we're talking about. Yeah, we've been talking about that. Uh, next one. If the riot is not the revolution, then how should we understand it in relation to revolution? Do you want to take a stab at that? <laughs> um, I think that a riotous experience can be like a revolutionary experience for the participants in that place and at that time. Um, I think, yeah, maybe it, maybe it is like a question of just expanding the riots, expanding the insurrection um, to more places um, for a longer period of time. But I also don't think that because I just want there to be, like I was saying at the beginning, um, a strong positivity, whatever that is, that's not just riots. Um, so I don't know. The question of revolution is one that I'm like not willing to give up, but I do find it to be very hard to think about um, without thinking about, you know, a civil war situation or a war situation, maybe it's not, you know, what we think of as a civil war situation. Um, so I don't know, I feel like this, this question is really asking like, what is the revolution? Because how can you understand the dynamics of something with something else if you don't really know what a revolution is right now? And I think that's one of our problems. So to me, this is just like a formulation of, of, a, of a, my, my response is only further questions. I don't know. Mm -hmm. How about you? I mean, to me, a revolution is a war in which one class overthrows another class. And a riot, but not, not really a riot so, so much as an uprising, like a mass uprising, mm -hmm. is an opening in which the potential for revolution arises. And I think, you know, and the way that that shift from like uprising to revolution would happen is through insurrection. And to me, insurrection is distinct from like an uprising or a riot in that um, it is like an organized, coordinated assault on like, like strategic kind of like weak spots and in infrastructure. So like a metaphor that I like is the idea of a dam and, you know, a revolt is when uh, you have, you know, say people with hammers hitting a bunch of different spots in the dam from a bunch of different places. And then the shift into the, an insurrection is basically when a specific weak spot in the dam is blown open and causes the entire thing to fall and creates an entire 
new kind of situation. So for me, that's how maybe the possibility of revolution arises. Um, but it, this is all like very abstract uh, and yeah, and very dangerous too, because it, it does, I think I agree with Brian that it carries with it the potential of civil war, especially in the US. But you know, this is, yeah, this is a huge question. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got a statement and one more question. Um, and then. Let's I wrap think. it up. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll read the statement. You read the question and then, okay. Uh, big emphasis on the dependence on technology. I never left my house for the uprising and from my own perspective, saw a lot of dependence on internet communication. Yeah. That is the world we live in. Yes. Screens everywhere. Currently on one. Yes. Able to talk to you all from Australia. Mm -hmm. Uh, question. One of the failures of the uprising that many comrades of mine point to is a lack of labor organization, without which there was no means to attack capitalist profits. Do you agree? And what are the ways that we can organize labor to prepare for the next kind of revolutionary actions we see? I think that there were a lot of strikes going on. This was COVID and a lot of people were also like walking off the job. Shortly after um, the, the uprising, there was also that, what did they call it? Uh, uh, the great resignation or whatever. So like it did kind of trickle in or like there was, there were definitely things going on in labor. Um, sectors you know i don't know more so than have been happening for a long time but really if you look at charts like labor organizing is just so far down from where it's been in the past and there's i just don't see it going back up um so i i don't really know how to organize labor um would be cool, right? But mm -hmm. yeah, I think the labor question is huge and is in a lot of ways the the missing link. Uh, I don't think it it is gonna happen in the same way, you know, as you know, one big union and then one big general strike or something like that. Uh, and, you know, go by what happened in the uprising and, you know, the kind of like labor struggles that were happening before the uprising, during and afterwards. Um, there, you can see that like there has to be a relationship between the riot and the strike somehow. And, and in a lot of ways, what, you know, like a mass strike might look like is actually more about expropriating businesses and destroying industries than actually taking them over and like running them in a new way. But then at the same time, just because most jobs now are not actually essential jobs, like it was obvious when the pandemic happened, uh, you know, that you only actually need 20% of the labor force in the economy for society to function. And most of it is actually completely unnecessary. Bullshit so, job. Yeah, yeah. And so, but for those essential sectors, you know, especially people that are like in transportation, uh, power, you know, like workers, logistics workers, people that are involved in like water and sanitation services, uh, mm. those kind of industries are extremely strategic. And we still don't really have a plan. Yeah. For how do you make the synthesis between the the workplace struggles and the the uprising, yeah, that's that's the million dollar question. And, but I do think, yeah, like it has to go beyond the uh, kind of models that we've inherited from the past. So I don't really think it's a matter of like organizing workers a certain kind of way or something like that. But 
Um, yeah, I don't know. And I, I just think that a lot of the people that have like really shitty jobs were probably a lot of the people that were fighting and rioting and taking part in the looting and all that kind of stuff. So I don't even see these as like separate realms of people, at least in terms of like the really kind of like precarious like retail service sector jobs. And also, you know, I can say like from personal experience that like I know for a fact that there was people that were like working in targets and Lowe's and places like that that helped basically like uh, help people expropriate the, the business. So that might point towards something, you know, that's like kind of what I'm trying to grasp at, but. Um, so before we go, I just want to say thank you again to the authors. This is a great book. I really enjoyed rereading it again, and everyone did a good job. Um, thank you to Glenda for having us and Firestorm Books for letting us do this event with you. And Archer, you're great. Thank you, everyone. Thank and you, everyone Ryan. who came. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and remember, uh, the Atlanta solidar well, solidarity with Atlanta, defend the Walani Forest. The, uh, the week of action is March 4th to the 11th. And check out Defend the Atlanta Forest and Stop Cop City on Instagram. I want to learn more about that. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan and Arturo. Um, yeah, folks, definitely check out uh, this collection of essays. It is really important, uh, very timely. Um, very applicable to you know, oncoming, incoming revolutions, I think. Um, it's abundantly clear that the uprising has like this continuously profound effect on people worldwide. And there are so many lessons um, to learn from and think about and countless tactics um, that can help us inch toward revolution, um, whether it be through riots or uprisings, playing music from a car, planting a community garden, um, getting your buds together to form like a mutual aid collective or a medic collective. Um, yeah, there are so many questions and as written in the beginning of the book, um, it is dedicated to all those murdered by police and all those who took great risks in fighting back. Um, so thank you again, Ryan and Arturo and everyone who uh, attended tonight uh, with love and rage. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.